Today, we are very happy to have Professor Stephen Abel from Durham University telling us about quantum annealers as tools for theory. So please begin. Okay, so thank you very much. It's very nice to be asked to give this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about some work which I've been doing with um, um, Juan Criado, Michael Spinovsky, also my student, Luca Nutricati has just joined us and we uh, began this work with Nick Chancellor who's in the quantum uh, quantum physics department in Durham and uh, and the sorts of things we were looking at is quantum annealers uh, as a tool for doing particle theory and uh, and so I'm really going to talk about two different aspects so first of all I'm going to assume that the audience is not uh, that much of an expert in quantum annealers because they're a little bit unusual compared to what you may know about quantum computing. Uh, so they're arranged in a slightly different way and the approach is slightly different. And my, in my view, the approach is in some respects more similar to what field theorists would like from a quantum computer compared to normal quantum computers. So, um, so I'm going to talk about two aspects. So the first is how you might go about simulating a field theory on quantum annealers. And I kind of speculatively call it a quantum field theory. Uh, we can discuss that later, but anyway, how to encode a field theory. And uh, the important thing that we want to do is encode it and we want to observe it tunneling. So so tunneling is, a, as you know, a non-perturbative process. So uh, it's very interesting to be able to create a non-perturbative field theory process. Um, the sorts of things you would talk about in field theory and to create it on an annealer. So that's the first part of the talk. And then the second part of the talk, I'm going to uh, discuss the more recent and slightly different use of these things, which is how to use them in order to build neural networks. So it's the idea is that these neural networks are constructed entirely in a quantum way. So um, I'll discuss that too. So hopefully it's a talk of two halves or three halves really, because I've got the annealer background as well. So, let, so here's just so you can put some faces to names. <clears throat> These are all the people that are involved in this. Oh, I also forgot Andrew Blank, who's a, a student. He was a student with us. So those are the people who've been involved in this work which kind of began with me, Michael and Nick, at the top. Right, so I'm going to start by just discussing what quantum annealers are, and I'm assuming that you don't really know very much about them, so apologies if you do know all about them and just sort of uh, read a book or something. Um, so if you are familiar with quantum computing, you're probably more familiar with what you learn in a quantum computing course. Um, at degree level, which is a kind of, uh, which is known as a discrete gate quantum computer. So the idea with a discrete gate quantum computer, those things, they're supposed to be, uh, they're universal. In other words, I can express any algorithm, quantum algorithm with them. Um, and you, so you normally arrange it like the diagram at the bottom. You think of it as uh, qubits, and I'll talk a little bit more about qubits in a minute, but your qubits are arranged on rails. And then you perform operations on those things. So you may perform, uh, you know, measurements or Hadamard gates or some sort of uh, action on them. And the idea is you want to keep the whole thing as coherent as possible. Um, a quantum annealer, on the other hand, so that's not universal. So it's built in a certain way. And I'll show you uh, what that means in a minute. But there's certain, only certain systems can be thought about. And the problems that you're thinking about are always optimization ones. So they're built for optimization and they're based on an Ising model. The difference between them in terms of what's available now, you'll see on the left, uh, IBM, if they're generous, you can get hold of maybe 50 qubits um, machines with IBM. Um, the people that make quantum annealer, so D-Wave are the people who are preeminent in this field, which is a Canadian company based in Vancouver. They have machines which are 5,000 qubits. So that's reaching the sorts of scales where you can really start to think about a kind of continuum sorts of processes, a real field theory sorts of things. Um, and so uh, they're 
arranged in a slightly different so the way you see these things is is it with this kind of diagram that i'm showing at the bottom here so you'll see there it's kind of it's nodes which are connected by couplings that's the way that those things should be thought of so it's not like the thing on the left it's slightly different approach both sorts of computers though are based on a block sphere so what you're interested in is measuring um to uh you know traditionally you think about spins in the z direction being measured and so you're looking for eigenvalues which are sort of plus uh, zero uh, plus or minus one <coughs> um and and so all of your qubits I mean, if you label them i the idea is that you're going to end up with some sort of answer when you do a measurement and the answer is going to be just basically a strings of zeros and ones so uh, the uses for the two things so if you're at the traditional one you're thinking more about um sort of discrete problems cryptographic problems so on um also things like entanglement bell's inequality so you can just run bell's experiment on your laptop with those things uh, quantum annealer uh, is really much better for looking at network problems so that's problems such as for example traveling salesman problems which are well defined uh, as a kind of network sort of way and that model so i'm showing you now how the thing is arranged at the bottom what you should think of it uh, quantum annealer is basically a hamiltonian um, and so uh, so i'm calling it hqa there the hamiltonian and what the hamiltonian is it's like the diagram i showed you before it's basically an arrangement of couplings so the couplings are j's and h's and it couples all of the different qubits together in a certain way so it's not completely universal so it's not like every sigma is connected to every other sigma but there's a subset and i'll show you in a minute what it looks like there's a subset of but quite a large connectivity uh, in the system ideally you would like it to be completely connective but unfortunately <laughs> we live in three space dimensions so it's not possible to completely connect them um but they are you can connect a lot of them to a lot of other ones basically um so in addition to that coupling between sigmas you're also able so so the j's you, are things you choose so when you're operating the thing you choose the couplings the j's and you're measuring the sigmas that come out and then uh, the H's are other couplings, so linear couplings, which you can use to bias the thing. So you can bias a sigma to be more or less positive um, to plus or minus one. And then the thing I'm showing on the right um, is a transverse field term, it's called often. So that is a, uh, so that's another coupling, but it couples to the sigma X direction. Uh, so this is what it looks like uh, on a typical machine. So this is the, this is kind of the last generation. Uh, so this had 2000 qubits, these machines. And it was arranged in what were called uh, these sort of eight blocks of eight. And so these are chimeras, they were called for some reason, <laughs> for some pretentious reason, they call them chimeras. Um, and so the, in this chimera here, uh, you have the every qubit on one side is connected to every qubit on the other side and it's connected to uh yeah so it's it's every qubit of these this four is connected to every qubit of that four and then these things uh the blocks the chimeras are also they also have connections between them the reason it's got that weird looking structure there is actually physically it is much easier to build it because it, so this is what it looks like in real space uh, the qubits are actually loops so it's kind of the dual of this of the nodes if you like it's the dual sort of configuration in space time so um it your qubit is a loop and uh, you see that that here i'm showing this is this is how the chimera is arranged you've got like eight qubits uh, four on the bottom and then four lying across the top so you see it's very easy to make this sort of arrangement because the qubits on the top hits all the qubits on the bottom. Um, so that's the way it's arranged physically. And so more recently, the 5,000 qubit ones, they have a more complicated arrangement. So it's a bit more connective um, and that's called a Pegasus for some reason. 
I, I, I think there must be some allusion to Greek mythology going on, but I've not looked into it. So that's the arrangement. So now why do we do that? So this is the Hamiltonian, just re recalling that for you. And, and so you remember it's got this, the Z parts, and then it's got the sigma X's. And the sigma X is with this coupling, the delta here. That what the idea of that is that if I turn on the delta, it will induce hopping in the Hilbert space. So if I turn off the delta, what happens is it tends to just like sit there. The sigma, I, I would have a sigma Z, which is fixed. All the sigma Zs would not change very much. Uh, and what induces them to change, to hop around, is the delta, so turning on the sigma x. So that's physically what happens. Um, what you do when you're trying to solve a problem, then, is I would, you first have to think about, well, how do I express the problem as a minimization problem of this Hamiltonian? So you, you will write, express your problem, whatever it is, and I'll talk about it in a minute with a simple example. Uh, you express your problem in terms of J's and H's. And, uh, and, and your problem solution will be that you minimize this Hamiltonian, so the ones in the, the Z Hamiltonian. And then you want to dial the, the sigma X term, the transverse term, in order to try and land in the minimum. So that's why it's called annealing. That's the meaning of annealing. And you see, it's very similar to what you do with thermal annealing, if you're familiar with that. You would try it and do exactly the same process. The difference is thermal annealing, you're doing a kind of Boltzmann thing that you're kind of heating it up and trying to fall into the minimum. Quantum annealing, you also have this fact that you can tunnel. And so the idea is that if you sort of dial up the quantumness of the thing with this delta, you want to find the minimum of the, of the Hamiltonian, of the Z Hamiltonian, which is often called the problem Hamiltonian. So you might have something like this. So the thing at the bottom is a, is a typical anneal schedule. And, and what that would be is I would begin with a large delta and a small J's and H's. And then I would dial down delta and dial up the J's and H's. And the idea being that I'm fluctuating a lot at the beginning, and then as I, uh, and so I'm exploring a lot of the Hilbert space, and then at some point I dial down the fluctuations and I'm supposed to land in the minimum. That's the principle. Right, so if you compare that to thermal annealing, which uh, with classical annealing, classical annealing is often done with the same sort of Hamiltonian. So you're thinking also about optimizing Hamiltonian. The difference between the behavior there is what is important. So if I am thinking about thermal tunneling, thermal tunneling is good for um, when I have a system which has got so uh, some sort of energy landscape and I have maybe some broad shallow maxima which I need to get over in order to find a global minimum, the optimum, the global minimum. Thermal tunneling is quite good at kind of lifting me over a low, shallow barrier, and it doesn't really care how wide it is. So that would be the bottom. The, the classical one is good at getting over this barrier. Not very good at getting between these steep, deep ones. So, um, so it's not very good at getting from one minimum to a slightly lower minimum nearby. Whereas quantum tunneling is quite good tunneling through that sort of thing so in terms of what in terms of tunneling rates and uh flip rate in in a typical thermal algorithm a thermal algorithm you would take a metropolis algorithm the way it works is you flip your sigmas with a, some sort of probability which depends on the hamiltonian and typically you would take it to be a boltzmann one quantum tunneling uh, i mean of course this uh, the difference is the top one because it's classical, so I can actually choose the probability. I don't have to choose Boltzmann. I could choose any function of delta H, really. But quantum tunneling, I am bound to choose the quantum tunneling behavior, which is given by a WKB approximation. So there, the tunneling rate, the probability of getting from one minimum to another really goes like e to the minus width times by square root 2m delta H. Delta H is the difference in the uh, in the 
um, Hamiltonians at the bottom. Um, and so you're slightly bound by uh, what quantum mechanics uh, tells you should happen with tunneling. But on the other hand, it is very efficient at getting between minima, which are sort of uh, so narrow but close together. So systems with lots of minima are very good for, for this sort of machine. So that's the idea. All right, so are there any questions at this point? I'm going to go and I'm going to start talking about a problem. Ah. Uh. I have a question. Okay, yeah. So can you go to the previous uh, slide? Uh, yeah. This, uh, the potential, yes, yeah, over there. So okay. here, yeah, for the second one, then you have the uh, true solution and but in the right, you have already the degenerative one. So uh, if you start from the right to the left, instead of the left to the right, then yeah. Yeah, right to the left then you yeah you can uh, yeah that yeah you have this uh, uh this uh the one that that is kind of a little bit a little, little bit higher but this uh very uh narrow data age and not, not narrow narrow very regenerative data age so that energy difference is not so big enough and yeah yeah then uh can this uh, quantum model find this degenerative case I'm uh, oh, sorry, which one, uh, which, which yeah, part? Well, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, yeah they have degenerated a little bit now. Yes, so that oh, right, maybe yeah. Oh, so, yeah. He, so you mean between, between here and there? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, it, it will do, yeah. I mean, uh, you have to leave it for a while, so, um, and then also what you have to do is, um, in the anneal schedule, you'll make it, uh, you, you may have to leave it for a while with quite a lot of, uh, you know, uh, quite a large transverse field power in order to kind of induce tunneling. Uh, but, it, you know, eventually it does find them. I mean, it's really efficient. We did, we did some, uh, you know, some sort of analysis and it is very, it's very effective at sort of finding, uh, you know, good tunneling from really quite closely, uh, closely degen almost degenerate minima, it will tunnel to the, uh, to the proper minimum. I see. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll let me show you how to start thinking about how well, how do I start? To put, what do I mean by put a problem on into a Hamiltonian? So here's a, a typical, a simple problem. So if I had a, some kind of graph like this with some nodes, how can I color the graph so that as many nodes are colored as possible uh, with none of the colored ones touching? So that's that a problem that you can put on annealer. So the way you would think about it is you assign uh, the proper property of color with an eigenvalue. So I, I will call non-colored vertices, I'll call eigenvalue minus one. So there's the white ones and the black ones I'm going to call eigenvalue plus one. And what I do is I take in my Hamiltonian, I give it a reward. So I want to color in the nodes i give it a reward so i say minus i've got minus lambda but lambda is some value uh, which is uh we'll, we'll talk about in a minute but some value of order one i give a i give a reward every time i can color in a vertex so every sigma which is plus one gets a minus lambda in the hamiltonian and then i want to give it a penalty if two colored vertices are next door to each other so what i do is I look at the linked pairs, so I have to sum over the linked pairs, i and j, and what I do is I, if I have this term, you'll see that if sigma i and sigma j are both positive, I get a plus three. I get a plus three from this term. Uh, so it's a penalty of plus three. So lambda has to be less than three, otherwise I'm gonna just color in everything and and this term is going to not be important. But if lambda is smaller than three, uh, this is enough of a penalty that it's not going to carry on coloring in vertices. So, uh, and then you'll see if, if sigmas have the opposite sign. So that's a white one next to a black one. Uh, this term is minus, this is plus, this is minus. So it's also a reward. It's minus, and then if they're both minus, you see this is two minuses, and this is a plus, so it's also minus one. So both minuses, both pluses are degenerate. 
um, sorry, both minuses or plus minus are degenerate for this term, but two pluses is a penalty. And so that's enough to make, so this would be something there where the machine would find the solution for you. So I'll show you a slightly more complicated one because that's sort of a simple one to get you warmed up. So suppose you have this problem that I've got a certain number of students. So I have an exam room. We've just gone back to in-person exams, but I know that half my students are ill and half of them are well. And what I want to do is I want to minimize the number of ill students that are sitting next to the number of well students in order to try and slow down transmission. This isn't the way it's recommended, by the way. But anyway, suppose I was that foolhardy and I was going to carry on with my exam and I just want to minimize the transmission of my disease. What I would do is I would try and arrange things so that as few ill students are close to are sitting next to well students. So I call the, the eigenvalue of the ill students, I call it plus one. And of the well students, I call that minus one. And um, if, so if I measure a sigma z at a point to have plus one, and then, then I conclude that an ill person has to sit there and vice versa. So if it's minus one, they go, it's a well person goes there. So the way you can arrange this on the annealer, it's, an, it's a square array, which I'm going to have. So I'm, I arrange it in rows and columns. So the rows are um, labeled L and the columns labeled J and I've got N on a side. So the story is I don't care. So it's very similar to the previous one. I don't care if A is sitting next to A or B is sitting next to B, but I care if A is next to B. So I want to avoid A being next to B. So I put a penalty of plus two on the Hamiltonian. So this is the way I can do it. So I go around all of the tables in the room, all of the I's and J's, the rows and columns. And at every value of uh, L say, I look at the, uh, so, so delta L M. So I've got, I've got, I'm looking at a certain um, row and then I look at tables in the row and I look at the table next door, plus one and the table minus one. So that's what this term is doing. And I apply a penalty, which is that I've got, I've got, so I've got one minus sigma of the I and sigma of the J. So if the two things are, uh, if the, to people, the I and the J, if they're the same sign, this is zero. So it doesn't care if they're both A or both B, but if A is not equal to B, so if it's an ill next or well, I get plus two. So that is it, that will do the thing of stopping A sitting next to B. And then the final thing I have to do is apply the constraint that I, uh, so remember that I know how many students there are. So there's, there's half of them are well and half of them are ill. So the way I can do that, I, I apply this constraint that the number of A's minus the number of B's is zero. That's what I want. So I'm going to apply that A minus B is zero. So the way to do it is with something. And if you're familiar with machine learning, you'll look at this and they oh, it's just like a loss function. So basically, it's just like a loss. You, you minimize this object as well. So A minus B. See, that's actually just the sum over all the sigmas, because every time I've got an A, I've got plus one and a B is minus one. So just sum over the sigmas. So I have this squared, I expand it, just get this term, which I add. And again, I just put lambda. This I can, this lambda can be quite large. You know, I just want to force that A is equal to B. So I'll show you what happens. Um, and I'm going to show you the Metropolis algorithm. So this is an actual Metropolis algorithm that I ran. I can't show you the same thing on a quantum machine, obviously, because as soon as you measure it, the, the experiment's over. But a Metropolis one, you can actually measure it every step. So this is what happens with the Metropolis algorithm. <coughs> I shall take the opportunity to have a drink one. So, so this is what it says. So it's accepting. So if you remember Metropolis algorithm, it accepts if it's... Uh, with a Boltzmann probability, or if it's a better solution, it always accepts it. So if it's the worst one, it accepts the Boltzmann probability. And if it's better, it will always accept it. So you see, I mean, it finds what we obviously know to be the, the sensible thing to do, which is you would put all of the ill students in one half of the room and all of the well students in the other half of the room. And that minimizes the number of 
ill ones sitting next, next to well ones. So that's the way you would solve it on this sort of Hamiltonian, an Ising Hamiltonian. <coughs> So there's various things that you can do now to compare this. You can compare this, what happens with a thermal with a quantum, uh, compared to a quantum. The Metropolis algorithm, you see the cooling time, as I increase the size of the lattice, the cooling time will increase and, and it increases roughly exponentially with the size of the lattice. So it's still quite hard. Whereas on a quantum annealer, uh, it works fairly quickly. I mean, a quantum annealer, that would same thing. And it actually takes longer to run it uh, than I showed you. So actually running it on my laptop takes longer than, than that <laughs> animation. Um, on a quantum annealer, it's done in microseconds, basically. So it really just tunnels down to the solution in microseconds. The way that you would do it on the quantum annealer, I mean, in case you're wondering, how do I actually access this thing uh, so you can google d-wave basically and you'll see that everything is done from within python so you can just write you just write a little python program and there are libraries for everything and so the commands that would do your tunneling would be something like this so you would you would call a sampler and then you would give the sampler arrays of h's and j's so remember h and j h is the linear coupling j is the quadratic coupling so you would just pass those couplings to the sampler and then off it goes and what it does is it returns a list of measurements a list of sigma z values which is in this case it's going to be n squared sigmas if i was doing that problem it would be n squared sigma it's just a list of pluses and minuses and it will send you a number of those things so you tell it how many times should i measure it so you see that's num num reads it's the number of times it does the measurement so it would send you an array of uh, this that's three million of these things of these measurements three million is actually quite a lot you wouldn't uh, it would probably be more like ten thousand or something but you would have like uh, just a huge list of these things uh, so the one thing, the one disadvantage of the quantum annealer, which is the thing that I mentioned before, that the connectivity is limited. So I can't connect every qubit to every other qubit. So it means that if I come up with a, a Hamiltonian, quite often it doesn't actually just fit directly into the architecture of the machine. And so what you have to do is you have to do, you have to use an embedding program, and I'll say a bit more about it later. An embedding program and what it does is it kind of ties qubits together as if they were like one qubit in order to involve other parts to access other parts of the machine to sort of build your using model up so that's called embedding the issue about embedding is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve something which is uh in complexity theory an np hard problem embedding onto the is also an np hard problem so you're kind of solving an np hard problem but on the other when you to get there you have to solve another one so the embedding program sometimes it can take a long time or it, it doesn't work at all if it's too complicated right okay so that's the setup of the annealer and the sorts of things you might use to solve might do to solve things on it so now what I want to do is talk about the first topic, which is um, how you might do quantum field theory on that thing and simulate quantum tunneling. So just I'm gonna, just going to tell you what you know already. Quantum tunneling is obviously very important in many aspects of uh, physics, which you're probably familiar with. The, the reason that for me it's so exciting to do it <laughs> is that this is a genuine instant on process so if you can get it to work and you can recreate a field theory using this ising model and see a tunnel what you're observing is something which is really a non-perturbative process in the field theory um and so as you know these things they're quite hard to treat mathematically non-perturbative ones um and also hard to simulate um, and i'll show you a sim simulation of one later um and also very few phenomena uh tunneling phenomena have been observed experimentally i mean there are certain restricted systems where you can observe them but we, we haven't actually observed any of the things like uh you know in uh, inflationary phase transitions and so on which 
we talk about all the time. So it'd be nice to be able to actually create these tunneling phenomena. Um, so our approach is really to try and encode them physically on the annealer. So this isn't really, it's not, people insist on calling it a simulation, but I prefer to call it a quantum tunneling experiment, really. It's really just a, you're really making a genuine quantum field theory and genuinely watching it tunnel. Our referees, when we publish the paper, they insist that we call it a simulation, but I don't really like that word. It's not quite a simulation. So anyway, let's try and do a simple tunneling in field theory problem. So, so this is the problem I'm going to look at. And it's really, I mean, it's a one dimensional problem. So it's really uh, quantum mechanics rather than quantum field theory that we're doing. But you can think of it as a, a sort of one dimensional quantum field theory. You can make it higher dimensional. So uh, if you ask me, I won't have time to talk about that, but if you ask me later, there is a, we, there is a route to making just a real genuine three-dimensional, four-dimensional field theories. Right, so this is the thing we're gonna look at. We're gonna make a potential. We're going to begin with the system stuck in the minimum on the left, and we're gonna watch it tunnel to the one on the right. So in quantum mechanics, obviously, you know how to do this. So this is the one dimensional Schrodinger equation that you would need to solve. And so you can plug that into Mathematica. So in Mathematica, uh, you, you start off with it like that. So it's in some sort of eigenstate at the beginning, which is a kind of almost bound eigenstate, long lived eigenstate. After a while, it does that. So it starts to tunnel through the barrier and you'll see a peak appear in in the global minimum. Uh, and as you let it carry on, as you let it carry on, this peak grows and eventually everything will be found over in the global minimum. So to produce these diagrams, by the way, takes an awful lot of time. I mean, this is done in Mathematica. It takes an awful lot of time, an awful lot of forcing the boundary conditions to not be badly behaved and so on. So yeah, this was done in Mathematica, but it's not particularly easy. <laughs> have to say oh and by the way this is the potential it's a tanch a tanch potential right so we, we want to try and do the same thing on the annealer so how do we go about doing that um the first thing we're going to do we, we think of it as a a, a zip well zero dimension zero space dimensional field theory in other words the the phi we're just thinking of as a field and the t is the time there's no x and so we just think of it as a zero dimensional, zero uh, space dimensional field theory. Uh, and so in the Schrodinger equation, uh, there's a kinetic term in the zero dimensional field theory. Well, and also when you're, when you're treating it in the Feynman way as a zero dimensional field theory. Um, and what we're gonna do is we, we're gonna assume the annealer is gonna provide the kinetic terms for us. And so we're only going to encode the potential and let the annealer do the tunneling. So really what we're doing when we are doing a tunneling experiment is we're really uh, measuring, if you like, the kinetic term, which is the, coming from the annealer. And we're just, so we just create the potential and we're kind of observing that there's dynamics in it. So the kinetic term is, uh, is sort of coming for free, if you like. We're not putting it in there. <clears throat> As I said, if I wanted to do a higher dimensional field theory, you would have to put in the gradients for the higher dimensional, the higher dimensions. So that's why this is easier, because doing gradients is harder. Right, so how do we encode a field, essentially? That's the first problem. How do we encode a field? So the way that, one way you can do it, and so we're thinking phi is a kind of continuous thing. Um, we're obviously going to have to discretize its value. So we, what we do is you choose n qubits. And what, what I'm going to do is if the qubits look like this, so if I, if I measure a whole load of eigenvalues of minus one, and then the rest are plus one, and the mine, and the, the, where it goes from minus to plus is at position j, <clears throat> I'm going to call that field value phi as phi zero, so some fiducial value plus j times by a small uh, parameter, xi. And so xi goes from, it'll go from one to n times xi. And so I kind of get my fields within a certain domain <coughs> where by varying the j's. 
so that's the that's the way that we encode the value of a field so this is a uh, a domain wall encoding and actually Nick Chancellor was the person that first wrote this which is how we came into this whole subject in fact so so this is Nick Chancellor's encoding the the spin uh, the domain wall encoding so if you give me this sigma the set of uh, sigma so with all the minuses and all the pluses I can translate it back to the uh, field value so the field value would be phi zero and then I need to extract j size so what I would do is I would sum over all the sigmas in this spin chain every time it's a minus it it contributes one so that's one minus sigma over two and when sigma's plus it doesn't count anything so this operator here at the bottom is counting the number of minuses so that's giving me the thing at the top so that's giving me a field value. So that's the way you encode the value of a field. So now the problem is obviously you need to avoid that sort of thing because this is nonsense. <laughs> if that's our encoding of fields, if it ever looks like this object, uh, that our encoding has failed. And so we need to avoid that. And the way you avoid it is very similar to with the exam room example. So you want to try and you give a penalty every time there's a minus sitting next to a plus. So it reduces the number of domain walls. So the number of uh, flips from plus to minus is, is hopefully just one. The way, you, the way you make sure there's always one is you, is you enforce that the left-hand side should be minus and the right-hand side should be plus. So the way to do it is what we call a, a spin, a chain Hamiltonian, we call it. So to enforce, the structure where it's minus and plus and then one domain wall you have a term which is sigma one so that's forcing a minus on the left a, a minus sigma which is enforcing a plus on the right so that like sigmas to be minus that uh, to be plus and then you have this term which is basically the same operator that went into the exam room example so that's the thing which minimizes the number of domain walls <clears throat> And so it gives you a, a bonus, a reward, if you can get rid of this thing here. So that's how you enforce the domain wall encoding of the fields. You add that thing. And again, lambda is a parameter. So in this process, there's an awful lot of playing around with lambdas to make it behave in the right way. All right. OK, so uh, that's just saying what I just told you. So uh, so you pin the ends at opposite values with the first two terms and then the penalty for domain walls is the last term. Right. So now, uh, so with this encoding and actually the thing which uh, Nick Chancellor was uh, the, the reason it was interesting for him is that I can encode any function of phi using this sort of encoding. I can write any function of phi because if I add this operator, so this is just phi, this is just u of phi inside there, so phi zero plus j psi, that's just the value of phi at that particular value of j, oh sorry, the sum is over j, not i here, that should be j. If I add this operator, what it does is it compares the j plus one sigma with the j sigma, and it gives me a, uh, it gives me one where the domain wall is. So, so at the point of the domain wall, I will get a contribution to the Hamiltonian, which is given by U of phi. Uh, actually, uh, multiplied by by J psi. So it's uh, it's given by U of phi, but the derivative of it. So it's the it's the difference of U at, at J plus one minus U at J. So I get the derivative multiplied by sigma J. Um, and so to, to write that, so this is u. So this is how I can put u into the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is now just u of phi, my phi. If I put these operators into the Hamiltonian, see these are just linear operators. <clears throat> it's just uh, terms in the linear couplings, just single, single sigmas. Um, and so you see, I only get a contribution where you get the flip. So if it's minus minus, I get nothing. And if it's plus plus, I also get nothing. So it's really just looking for the domain wall. Uh, hi, uh, before you go on, can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, because, uh, okay, so here 
Okay, so you have the, this variable, okay, the potential, the period, pi period, but let me just uh, interpret this pi as a just variable x. And uh, you want to minimize the function ux. Yeah. Right. But uh, because uh, this uh, annular is, uh, is good for the described uh, describe problem, so you describe this variable x by the number yeah. of n, and uh, this interval size is a uh, question, right? Yeah. I see. But how can you determine the Cauchy? Uh, after you saw after you saw the, this uh, potential, and then you are making sure that uh, the Cauchy uh, is enough uh, small enough so that you can uh, put in the, this minimal global mm. minimum position, right? Yeah. So it means that yeah, so you you need to know the, the uh, how the, this uh, potential looks like, right? To, oh, um, decide uh, this interval Cauchy. Um, you mean. Well, I mean, you you would try and, I mean, in a way, you're sort of you're you're kind of doing what you would do if you were doing lattice field theory. I mean, you discretized it, <clears throat> and then if I wanted to try and uh, talk about the continuum limit of this thing, I would be then trying to take larger and larger ends, and I, and at some point I would say, okay, now I've reached some kind of continuum limit. Um, so at the moment. You basically, where because the machines are not that big, we can just say, well, we'll take a, as many n as large an n as we can. But um, yeah, I mean, in principle, it's always an, a, a lattice approximation to the continuum. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sir. Right. So, uh, so in this particular problem, then we're done basically. So you take those. Uh, contributions to the Hamiltonian, add them together, put them onto the, uh, and put them into the machine. So you send it the J's and H's and, and see what you get. So just uh, before I show you what you get. <clears throat> uh, so for this example, we took N equals 200 qubits, which is quite large. So, if, so this is the entire machine that you're seeing here. So if you, if I were to zoom in, I don't think I can zoom in. But, but these little bits there are the chimeras, so they're the blocks of eight. And you see, this is the solution that it's found, so your little embedding program. It's, it's put the Ising model, it covers, you know, a third of the whole thing. So I don't know if, if anyone else trying to use it gets annoyed when we do this, but anyway, we, we end up using quite a lot of this, uh, this machine when we're doing this thing, because we're trying to, we are occupying as many qubits as possible. <clears throat> compared to what people normally do typically if they're not field theorists who are desperately trying to make something continuous they may be using like eight or ten or twenty qubits or something so we're slightly uh, you know we're dialing it up quite a lot from what people normally do when they're doing this sort of thing right so when you pass it to the annealer so you got our h's and j's we don't it's not really continuous so as we just saying it's not continuous but it's becoming continuous so this is what the annealer sees this is the sort this is the potential the annealer <coughs> sees so the field values are discretized so there's 200 of them and this is the potential that's that the, the annealer seeing you see there's always a dropped qubit at the beginning because of the boundary condition which hopefully we can ignore um because we're trying to get to down to here which is lower so it looks right, basically. And so this is the result. And what I'm showing you is, um, uh, what I've done is I've set the, uh, set the minimum at some value, so two and a half. Uh, and then I'm showing you values, uh, the results for different times. So we're measuring after 50, 100, 150 microseconds. And so uh, this is this is the result of having done many reads. <clears throat> so you do maybe to build one of these graphs, you would do maybe a hundred thousand reads or something of the machine, and then every every read will give you a field value. So you know you have a certain number of sigmas, certain arrangement of sigmas that corresponds to a field, and then you build up this graph. So this graph is really uh, it's the probability essentially of of where you are so it's really uh you know you can really think of it as the wave function squared if you like 
and you see it just behave in the right way. So the that the um, you know as I let the temperature as I let the time continue, it starts to build up. It starts to all end up in this uh, in the true minimum. So it looks like a genuine tunneling going on, and um, in principle, and I'll I'll tell you what I mean by in principle. In principle, it's an experimental measurement of the wave function squared. If you're thinking of this as an entirely quantum thing. And also, you may wonder well, what happens when I move the minima around. So it also behaves in the right way. Um, so that if you're if you move the minimum, the the global minimum away, it decays uh, as you would expect if you were doing the uh, the non-perturbative WKB approximation. So that is, it goes something like e to the gamma. So uh, sorry, gamma goes like e to the uh, e to the uh, square root delta hv and so on so um it looks like that so the theory should give you this so it's five thirds minus v and the experiment is not that far away so the tunneling rate looks pretty good the thing which is hard to get is the prefactor here so you see the stuff in brackets it behaves in the right way uh, the fit to so so you see the data is our of these blobs here and the fitted curve is the thing at the bottom. So now why did I say in principle? <laughs> you have to remember through all of this that the quantum annealer is not a coherent, it doesn't maintain coherence for that long. So uh, what I believe is that, so there's, a, there's definitely quantum tunneling, there's no doubt about that. And you actually can test, make various tests that it's really quantum, not thermal, so for example, if you dial down that delta, so if I if I stop any kind of hopping, if I dial down the transverse term, it will just sit there. So if I start it here at the green line, it never moves anywhere, even though it can be sitting on the side of a potential. So you see the thermal effects, which are there in the machine, they're not making it move from this state here. So even though, if I had like a small number of qubits, if I had eight qubits or something, thermal effects might become important. But when I've got 200 of them, in order to, <clears throat> in order to move a field, it means that I have to somehow shift thermally 200 qubits. So you see, it's, it's not gonna happen. There's too many qubits. So the tunneling behavior is certainly quantum. What you may, object to or worry about and it's things that it's something that we are still thinking about really it's how much of the quantumness is there if i can i for example uh, you know recreate eigenstates and just measure eigenstates you know genuine wave functions um when the system itself so, so this would be wave functions in phi the system itself is not maintaining coherence so it's it's you know, it's kind of up in the air. Probably what we're seeing is quantum tunneling, but the, uh, you know, the, the system itself, when it's sitting there in a minimum, is not then sitting there quantumly, but the tunneling is quantum, much like the early universe, in fact. <laughs> we had to have a, a, a quite, quite an argument with our referees about the fact that if you have something where there's a thermal effect, does not mean it can't quantum tunnel. Okay, so also, I mean, to make to just to test that this is really quantum behavior, not thermal behavior. You can also do the following sort of thing, um, and this does look more quantum. So if I make this potential, so this is a two-dimensional potential, so I introduce two phi's, phi one, phi two, um, and see what happens. And I'll just show you that. Um, it kind of does. It does more what happens in quantum than thermal system so the quantum system <clears throat> what happens is it doesn't move it doesn't roll down as a single blob it what happens is it grows at the minimum and it goes sinks where you where you started it grows at the minimum you never see a blob rolling down the hill and so and that's more what happens in quantum than thermal so this is sort of the the heat map of the same thing yeah Okay, so, well, that's that story. I mean, it's, 
it's still a subject which I think needs a lot more work, basically, just to just to figure out well, what sort of field theory we're we actually making here. Um, and so how much of the quantumness is left in the actual field that can you can you even do things like an interference experiment, that sort of thing. So it would be great to be able to do that. I don't know if it's uh, if it's possible, but we're trying various things essentially. Right. Okay. So I'm going to go on to talk about the neural network, and I'm kind of running out of time. But uh, hello. Uh, before you proceed, uh, yeah. for the tunneling case, you show an example in the quantum mechanics, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. This is this is quantum mechanics, basically. Yeah. Uh, if you, uh, I mean, have you worked on the, uh, I mean, one dimension, the how to say one plus one dimensional quantum physics? Yeah. Uh, one. And do you have any uh, concrete worked out examples in the? Uh, yeah. So, um, so that so going to higher dimensions is difficult, and the reason why. I mean, difficult in terms of what's possible on the machine at the moment, because um, because if I want to introduce a space dimension, so I then I need to put in the kinetic terms for that. Yes. And so I need derivatives. And when I write a derivative, um, I am then coupling. So you see, I've got to have all of, and it's the double derivative, so I've got mm -hmm. derivative squared. So I'm gonna have all of the sigmas at I coupling to all of the sigmas that I plus one in order to get a derivative, you know, I need to find the difference between them all. And so the connectivity then is much higher than it would be without the kinetic term. Yes. And so, and so what happens is you kind of hit, you, you hit the limits of what the machine can put on it, of what you can put on the machine. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with those things, you couldn't really go, you know, your, your, is your n would be sort of like 10 or something rather than 200 <laughs> so you you wouldn't be able to do very i mean at the moment so with larger machines you'll be you'll certainly be able to do it and in our paper we describe how to do it so we've written the hamiltonians for it but at the moment it's probably too difficult to put it onto a machine i mean we're kind of in the middle of trying to do it essentially mm -hmm. it would be very nice to be able to you know, to, to observe a, a like a uh, bubble nucleation events, you know, this oh, sort right, of thing. Right. Yeah, right. and you know, you would you would be able to say they would, turn, you know, they would you'd observe the bubble and then it would sort of uh, expand as you expect, you know, this. Sort of so yeah, I would quite like to be able to do it. The difficulty though, I mean, one thing that you have to worry about when you're doing the one-dimensional thing. It can only appear in one place, so you know you're measuring. Um, you're me when you're measuring the sort of the bubble nucleation, the nucleation, it's always appearing in a single place. If I'm if I have a two dimensional system, mm. a bubble can nucleate anywhere, and so uh, in the end, what I have to do is I have to kind of seed it by having something which is going to make it nuclear in a in a place, certain place in in the space dimensions so i have a symmetry in the space dimension a translational symmetry which is just going to fill up the whole x though i want to make sure bubbles always appear in the same place mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. anyway yeah i mean those things they're they're great to think about and we're certainly thinking about them but okay. yeah thank you yeah. so yeah i'd be excited i'm excited to do those things so basically not enough hours in the day but <laughs> Right, okay, so now I'm going to talk about this, the more recent thing, which is uh, encoding neural networks, quantum neural networks. So let me recap what, I mean, what the problem is, essentially. So you have, uh, as you know, probably classical neural networks. So in your, when you have AI in your phone and so on, what you, what you have is a neural network. And what the neural network has inside it is a solution to some sort of problem and it's encoded in a set of weights and biases in a in a, in a set of nodes so your network is arranged like this so it's arranged where you you would have some uh, features so that is something the input the data is the x 
And then what happens is you feed that data through several layers, which are called hidden layers normally. And at the end, it comes out in a layer, which is the output layer. And the couplings between the nodes here are uh, called weights. And there's also a, a sort of universal coupling, which is called a bias. And the way that neural network works is you try and arrange the weights and biases in order to give you solutions to a certain problem. And so what happens in the end is that when you have that set of weights and biases, you put in some new data, it will give you the solution in your output Y. And so, you know, in principle, it, you know, once it, it's seen all the possible data, so it will give you the cor as correct a solution as it possibly can. <clears throat> And so the way it's arranged, the Y is the stuff that comes out at the end. Every time it goes to a new layer, uh, you take the data in the layer before, so that would be X, X here. You multiply it by a weight. So XI, I, I is labeling the layer. Uh, so, so the hidden layers are all labeled I's. Uh, so you take your XI, you multiply it by a weight and you add a bias. So that's just a constant. And then it's a function of that thing. It's a function of that thing. So that is what happens at every level, every layer. And then the output is basically you do that n times if there's n layers in the thing. So And then that goes into your output. So, you know, just a, a kind of repeating the same structure, basically, but it's input, hidden, and then output. The output can be just one number. So if it's like a classic classification problem, so you want yes or no, you, you, would, you could output one number and uh, you would then apply to the number if it's bigger than a half, you would say it's yes, if it's less than a half, it's no, <clears throat> that sort of thing. So that would be what you do for a, a classification problem, but you know, generally it could have more outputs. Um, and so uh, this is describing the same thing more in, in slightly more excruciating detail. So, so here I, I'm taking H. So this is the hidden layer one is given by the function G, the activation function, as it's called, times by that argument. And then H2 is given by that. H3 is given by that. Right. So the problem, though, is that what you need to do is that you need to make the network learn and so I'm thinking about supervised learning uh, for this. And so what you do is you, you want to minimize uh, or you, you want to optimize this network for weights and biases. So you're gonna, what you do is you feed in data, which you already know the answer to, into, into the thing and you define a loss function, which is a function of all the weights and biases. And you feed in all the data that you've got. So the data is labeled A. You, you feed in the Ys that you know, because this is data you know already what the answer is, and the, the data is X, your output that, that you know is Y. You feed that in, you minimize this entire gigantic function. So if you've got like a thousand points of data, there's a thousand terms in this thing. <clears throat> you minimize the loss function by adjusting the weights and biases. So you've got something which is like a very high dimensional, with no, dimensions being the numbers of weights and biases, a very high dimensional gradient descent problem essentially and so this is this is the way i don't need to describe what gradient descent is probably but you know you you, you want to move around in this uh, high dimensional parameter space in order to optimize the loss function that's the way that you normally will find all of the weights and biases once you've got the weights and biases you're done you know you can you can put the same neural network wherever because you know the weights and biases so this is the problem and so finding this set of weights and biases is the problem it's really a, a kind of np hard problem if you like and the the landscape can be very complicated that you're looking at so it can take a long time to do this learning and so uh, what we discussed in our paper is how you can do the same thing on a neural network. So you see the, the idea of minimizing a loss function is something which kind of looks natural on a quantum manila. It's basically built, it's made, is what quantum manilas were made to do basically is minimize loss function. So really all we need to do 
is take this loss function and encode it in a quantum annealer Hamiltonian. And then you determine the weights and biases. <clears throat> so you can think about this, as people have thought about doing this before, that maybe not in the best way we would argue. There, there, are, there are various problems you want to solve and things that you have to avoid doing. So if you think about the loss function, the amount of data you're going to want to put in there is massive. So you know, you're going to want to have, you're going to want to put in thousands of points of data. You want to certainly avoid trying to encode Y or X, or certainly X. You want to avoid encoding X in data, you know, in the qubits, because you know your Ising model is just going to be enormous if you do that. So that would be a very inefficient thing to do. What you want to do is the, the Y and the X are going to be classical things, uh, their data that you know, or uh, outputs that you want to get. The thing that you want to encode in qubits is weights and biases. And so we, we encode it in a binary fashion. <clears throat> and at the end, you want to just read off the values of the weights and biases that your machine gives you. The thing you have to uh, just bear in mind, though, is the Hamiltonian is going to be still going to be high, a high order polynomial in sigmas. And also because it's binary, a binary encoding of a, something of a sort of almost what would you, the weights and biases you would normally think of as kind of continuous numbers, real numbers. Um, if you're going to encode them in a binary fashion, you're going to need a lot of qubits just for every single weight. So it can quite quickly become large, the Ising model you need to encode this thing. Uh, and then the other thing is that, that it's quite large. And remember the annealer is not fully connected. So some of the couplings are missing. And so we need to find an embedding that will, will put our model into the annealer. So again, as I said before, uh, it, this, Finding an embedding is also can be a hard problem. So anyway, we're slightly restricted with what we can do, but you can still do something. So I'll show you what we were able to do. So uh, when we uh, when we did this, we took us we just took a single hidden layer. And so we we you know we're really restricting things quite a bit. A single hidden layer, in other words, our output y from data input x is a function like this. So it's V, VI is the more weights. It's the final set of weights. And then G is going from, um, uh, G is the activation function, but it acts only on the inputs once. So you don't have this nested lots of Ls. There's only one L. And then there's the bias, the V0. <coughs> so the other thing I uh, should have mentioned, which makes things more complicated, on an annealer is the function, the activation function has to be nonlinear for a for this to work. But it can still be quite simple. So what we took for our activation function is really it's just a quadratic. So you see if I want to if I want to do something which is a high order polynomial like x to the 10 or something, x to the 10, I'm going to have a 10th order polynomial in sigmas. So that's going to be very hard to encode. Uh, but, but a quadratic works OK. So, so what the loss function looks like, uh, so remember, it, it's this. So it's this thing, this object squared. Each of these y's is, looks like that. So I'm expanding it. This is expanding the y's with this activation function in there. <clears throat> So this is, so you see this, I can put this onto a Hamiltonian. So if you expand this thing, I put it onto a Hamiltonian. But the problem is that the Vs and the Ws, Vs and Ws, they're all built out of stigmas. The Xs and the Ys are real numbers, but the Vs and the Ws, the weight, the things we want to get, those are in sigmas. And you see that there's three here. So this is a cubic. And then the whole thing is squared. So it's actually a sextic in sigmas. So what you have to do is a it's called a reduction. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just show you quickly. I'm sorry, sorry, I'm running over time, but I've got one more slide to go basically. So this is how the weights gen are put in. So they're put in in terms of a binary encoding. So every weight 
would be minus one um, plus, and if you expand this thing, you're basically, it, you're encoding as a binary up to NB. So it's a, a NB, uh, sort of one over two to the NB can appear there. So it's a discretized binary numbers. Um, and the TL is, uh, this is the binary thing coming from the sigma. So sigma can be plus or minus one. So T tau can be zero or one. So that's the binary encoding uh, involving the stigmas. So those W, so you, would, you shove these things into the Ys. You have this gigantic sextic in sigmas. And then what you have to do is you have to reduce it to quadratic. Uh, this quadratic, this reduction is the kind of subject in its own right, really. Um, and the way that you do it is by introducing auxiliary spins that represent pairs of spins. So that's an exercise for later. You, show, you can show that if I add this Hamiltonian, the, eigen, the value of tau 1, 2, if lambda is large enough, the value of tau 1, 2 is the same as, the, as tau 1 times tau 2. So everywhere in the Hamiltonian, I can replace the pair tau 1, tau 2 with the single tau 1, 2. So this tau 1, 2, can the single qubit can replace the pair of qubits. And by doing that, I can reduce it down to a quadratic. It's obviously something, is, it, for something so large, it's quite complicated. So, you know, it's, um, you just put it on a, you just put it in Python or send, essentially and let it crank away. Uh, and it, it will give you a gigantic Isaac model. But in the end, it's possible. So let me show you what happens when you do that. So we tried it with different data sets, so circles, quadrants, bands, and then um, a TT bar <coughs> data. And so, uh, so the TT bar, it's what you're looking for is uh, the, the highest transverse momentum of a B jet and the missing energy. So that's a two dimensional, that's this one at the bottom. It's a two dimensional parameter space. So it's the highest transverse momentum and the missing energy. And then um, and what I'm showing you is um, background and uh, signal, essentially. So it's distinguishing signal from background. And so, and then the black lines are the, are the lines where your Y, that, so that's, so now you, uh, once you've done it, you can then put in your, the new data and your, your back and the, the black line here is what's come out of the uh, minimizing the loss function. So you see it's doing a pretty good job of distinguishing signal from data in this case and, uh, you know, inner circle from outer circle with that data. So one advantage, so I'm pretty much finished, but uh, an unexpected advantage, essentially, I think is uh, with the way we write it here, the weights and biases are quite discretized because, you know, our binary numbers, they're not real numbers. They're just, uh, you know, uh, maybe up to in quarters or something. We can still do the training because we're on a neural network. If, you, if it was a classical machine, those things would represent barriers in a landscape, you know, to flip from a quarter to three quarters. If you've got a real number, it's, uh, it's not obvious that it's going to be able to do it. And actually we compared uh, and the classical, uh, the classical neural network minimization, uh, optimization doesn't work very well with such discrete weights and biases. Right, okay, so let me let me conclude. So hopefully you get some idea that, that quantum annealers are quite a powerful tool for particle theory, mainly because they kind of represent Ising models that you can use in order to do sort of, um, in order to try and recreate field theories, but also you can apply them to optimization problems of all sorts, really. So I think they're really sort of becoming an interesting tool that we can use. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much for the nice talk. Other questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question, of course. <laughs> 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 okay, can you go back to the, okay, uh, maybe two or three questions, but can you go back to the, this activation, uh, activation function? Uh, to the, oh, activation function. Activation, yeah. yes, yes, the scale one, yes, quadratic, yes. Uh, 
yeah, yes, that's over right. there, yes, GX. So, yeah, the, there are many reasons for the machine learning for the activation function, but, but here, just to make the nonlinear, right? It's the most. Yeah, so this is to be nonlinear, and then, and then, yeah, and then the domain for X is going to be uh, between minus one and plus one. <clears throat> or uh yeah minus one to plus one so so g starts at zero and goes oh, the x to... is a bi x is a binary That's yeah the x is, yeah 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 well it, it in principle it can be a real number but uh it's uh, I, I we need its domain to be minus one to plus one but it, but you see the the way it's it won't be binary because in the argument of x the the argument x includes also this real numbers x so it'll be the binary weight times by real numbers. So the X's that go in there are going to be binary. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, um, what goes into the arguments of G is not binary. Then uh, for the example that you have the circle and the, this, that, uh, the last example, then here, yeah. what's the X in the last example? example? Oh, so, um, yeah, th so this x you can see it in the in the y that I've written at the bottom there. Yeah. What this what this x is really is going to be is some w's times by x data, and so yes, it's x the, is the data, right? Yeah. Yeah, x is the data. The w's the sigmas. Yeah, so the w's binary. Yes. Yeah, so the w's are binaries, um, but they're multiplied by x. So you see, so the advantage of this, you know, I probably didn't. I should have stressed it more, but. When you do this gigantic loss function and you expand it, all of these A's here, you know, all of the data is there in one quite uh, small. So you, you you have to add all of the A's together, but you see this is just like one coupling in the end. You have to sum over all the A's, but all of the data that you put in there is not are not new terms. You know, they're all just added all at once. So you know there, there's a there's an implicit in the loss function there's a sum over a, but that just that's just like a coupling. The whole thing just goes into a coupling, which is given by all of the data in one single coupling. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that that's the advantage to what people have tried to do before because um, yeah, I think people try to encode the data, which then restricts the amount of data you can put in, obviously. Hmm. Yeah, so, so uh, anyway, so here, uh, okay, the equation function is to just to make the binary, uh, not binary, the quadratic equation, right? So that you have the, yeah. this uh, quadratic equation. So that's uh, very easily to import it into this IG model, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. That's this thing. Yeah. Yes, and I think that will be enough because you don't suffer any because you, you don't do the any ordinary gradient method so you will not suffer any problem that machine learning can uh, machine learning have so yeah yeah so we can, that's right there's no yeah so we never we never do any kind of gradient descent or anything no no, no yeah. you can you can actually so what i did do i mean something which is kind of interesting <laughs> it's not this but you can you can do a sort of partial gradient descent so um if I have something like a function and I'm trying to optimize it and I have a sort of some basis, but it's not like a complete set. So I'm not doing like a Fourier series, but maybe I have something like a, a um, you know, sort of X, X squared, X cubed or something. And I want to optimize the coefficients. What I can do is I can do something like this and it gets me very close to where I need to be. And then I do one step of like Newton Raphson or something, and that will give me very accurately the answer. So it, you can do a kind of a partial half and half sometimes. So that might be an approach and maybe an approach to use this to mainly to get, you know, a good idea of the weights and bias. And then there's a final step of gradient descent where you're kind of almost at the answer. But then the final step of gradient descent is then uh, much easier because there are no barriers. You know, you're close to the answer. Ah, I see. So you, you, yeah. okay. So you are thinking about some kind of hybrid method, right? I think you could. Yeah, I think you could probably make. Ah, it hybrid. I see. I see. I see. Because uh, yeah, this is kind of like an initial guess. So you, the the current mm, yeah, yeah, machine learning, right. yeah, for the initial uh, for the depend oh, because they cannot find the exact global minimum or the so that they have, they have some local minimum problem. So the 
this machine learning performance depend on the this initial value of the weight and bias. Yeah. So they, they yeah, are yeah, yeah, for the, yes, right. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that, that's exactly the exactly the, the problem. The same, where yeah. where do you start basically? If you're near, if you know, if you're close to where the answer is, then it's I see, no problem. I see. Yeah, I see, I of course, I, yeah, I just I just want to ask that because uh, your weight is binary, so maybe there's uh, some limitation. But if you think that this is uh, like uh, choosing the initial value for the uh, ordinary machine learning algorithm, uh, yeah. then uh, this will be very good. And because you don't yeah. do any iteration, right? You just have uh, one single uh, this unlinking of the yeah. process, then it's done. Then uh, this is initial yeah, exactly. value, then you just put uh, okay, machine learning. I see. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Great. Yeah. Yes. So then, good. then you would start, that would be your starting point, basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. This is very good. Yes, yes. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Steve, hi. Uh, one hi. question concerning uh, this process of mapping your weights and uh, biases onto the network. The, the, the problem is really that you have to do a kind of dualization, right? That you map weights and biases from the uh, neural network onto your physical structure uh, of yeah. the quantum computer. Yeah. Um, can you turn this question around somehow and uh, and look at what is the best weight and bias system adapted to your uh, to your neural network architecture? All oh, right. You mean that I you wouldn't specify uh, the number of nodes or hidden layers, and you would optimize those. It, it, so very naively, probably this is this is utterly wrong. But very naively, this looks to me a little bit like a Fourier, Fourier transform because you you want to map links and uh, and biases, um, i.e. momenta, uh, into uh, into your nodes, i.e. into into the X yeah. rays. But your your physical structure of the quantum computer is fixed. Meaning, yes, I, the I dual see gives yeah. you a set of problems which are most easily solved uh, without too much uh, mm. of this. Um, sorry, how do you did you call it modulation or reduction of uh, reduction? Yes, yeah. yeah. So uh, okay, that's an interesting point actually. So so I, yeah. So I could all right. So I think I can. So you can imagine. I think what you're saying. <laughs> I'm an interpreter. Oh, by the way, it's very nice to see you, Thomas. <laughs> I didn't say hello, but it's been a um, long time. So, um, <laughs> you didn't have a beard last time. <laughs> so um, it's been a very long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think so. Yeah, I think what you're saying is if, if I look at the Ys, this thing, it looks like a polynomial, and it's just a, poly, a, a big polynomial at the end. And what we're doing is we're fixing the coefficients of the polynomial. And so I think your question would be, well, could I drop some of the terms in the polynomial, keep some other ones? Which are the terms I need to keep? And, you know, so, so if some of the weights are giving me that the terms are zero, are vanishing, I could say, well, I, I don't need those nodes at all. Um, maybe, yeah, maybe that's the sort of thing. Yeah, it's, it it's, I, I think it's a, it's a super interesting question, but I've... I have no idea how it would. No, it's more it like uh, here you're on the function uh, with the um, single hidden layer already, but it's really yeah. you have a physical um, structure of your quantum computer, uh, which should map into um, a an optimal set or a basis of um, of weight functions and biases. Oh, okay. All oh, right, I see. And oh, I see. those yeah. weight functions and biases might be very um, useful or adaptable to certain uh, neural network structures. Right. I.e., uh, but it's not a one-to-one -one mapping between the the network hmm. structure uh, uh, between the quantum computing. A network structure and uh, the uh, the neural network structure, because it's mm. you, you kind of need to do a dual mapping. So I I don't know whether this is useful or, help, or helpful in any way. I was just thinking whether you have been looking into this or thinking along those lines. You mean thinking in the actual physical 
picture rather than the nodes and no 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 i uh, i mean um what the the subset of questions is in this context for neural networks mm. um which you can optimally address with the uh with a com quantum computing structure i.e what this uh this this physical structure of the uh of the quantum computer is mapping to uh okay um well, we have, we haven't thought of that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the short answer is no, but your your questions are stimulating a lot of interesting thoughts. But um, yeah, we haven't thought about about that. Sorry, it was just a wild shot. <laughs> Further questions or comments? So, uh, could you show this uh, uh, four plus uh, yeah. near the end of this? So here, uh, I think the, you have a very good uh, separation between red and blue dots. Yeah. Uh, the, if you did a, a a similar thing using the standard uh, classical neural network you don't have such a good separation oh no i mean uh well i don't think we've done from the beginning or we we uh, we can't be a classical neural network at the moment i mean i think yeah to do the gradient descent on this problem wouldn't be very difficult uh, yeah so at this stage we're not really competitive with those but um i mean at some point i think we can be but mm. at the moment, you would be mad to use. That. You would not be very wise to use this for if you were if you were just trying to find uh, a neural network for these problems. But I mean, um, you know, when they become much more high dimensional, mm. I think then at that point it's going to be start to become competitive for uh, much higher dimensional problems. Mm. Then gradient descent is going to start to become, uh, you know much more difficult to do so and typically you know people are doing so certainly in say medicine or something you may have 20 dimensional parameter spaces that you're trying to find a loss function in yeah uh, optimize a loss function in. so yeah then then it starts to get quite complicated mm -hmm. i mean so not to not uh yeah not even 20 dimensional i mean it's uh you know the the inputs you can have 20 inputs um so you know at least 20 <laughs> weights but you know typically if you want a, a few hidden layers you're going to be talking about you know hundreds of weights basically but uh, here you are limited by the number of the available cubic yeah right. that's right so here, so. yeah so here we're we're limited by the number of available cubic if you were to um so if you were to increase the number of weights um, to something where, or, or to, so the number of X's, so say you would have, uh, say 20 X's. So this is you know, sort of something that people use uh, for sort of, that there's a set of standard problems. So one of them, I think has 20 bits of data. Uh, you could still then operate in this way. So you're not then, the connectivity, I mean, it's going to get worse, but I, I, I'm not sure how badly it goes up, uh, the relation between the number of X's and the number of weights, that, uh, the number of, that, well, the, the kind of difficulty of putting the Ising model on the machine. Um, it's not obvious it's, it's going to go up sort of exponentially if you're, final if find the final node is only one node you know because you just want if it's a classification problem um and so typically so for example the sort of problem you you might use is something like you want to diagnose if someone has got cancer or not you would take in a certain uh, like 20 pieces of data and you just want to say you just want a yes or no answer so you know if there's one hidden sec hidden layer you just have one node and then you're going to have a large number of x's at the front 
for all the data that goes in. But I think the number of weights isn't going to go up massively in that case. And I think the connectivity is also probably handleable. So my guess is that if we were to get machines with, say, 50,000 qubits or something, you could start to look at those sorts of things. Yeah. So it, it depends. I mean, the topology really depends a lot on the sorts of problem that you, you're asking about there. Yeah, by the way, so I like this very much because that uh, usually in the machine learning, the weight are uh, continuous. So if I was if I want the weight to be minus one plus one or binary, then I cannot use mm -hmm. the uh, conventional machine learning to train. But you yeah, turn right. uh, the problem into the, this binary. Yeah, uh, <coughs> yeah, the that's weight. right. So I think this is very nice. Yeah. Yeah, that was the thing which was quite striking, really, and. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's why we compare we compared the training. Even for this simple problem, <clears throat> we we're better than uh, you know classical training will get stuck on this problem. Mm. If you're insisting on a binary weight, yeah, yeah, this is the reason that the clustering problem is, is very good uh, yeah. for the clustering. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Other more questions or comments? You should have come to Jeju. <laughs> yeah, we should start this. Uh, we should okay. start these meetings again. <laughs> A good comment. <laughs> okay, if there are. No more questions or comments. Uh, we may thank Professor Abel again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I, I'll go and get my morning coffee now. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Okay, bye. Thanks bye -bye.